if you're an entrepreneur, what you want to do is you want to pick something so small that it's silly, but you want to convince yourself that if you're playing the chessboard, that you're not locked in by the pawns, that you can like attack these adjacencies really, really easily based on what you build. Jordan, I'm excited to continue our conversation. In our in our first chat, uh, we were really looking at the retrospective meeting app that you have built and have been developing over the past five years. I'd like to hear more about your story. H how did you get to where you are today? And you can even go before the five years before that. Sure. Um, my personal story in tech is one, I was fortunate to be born in 1980. And I do not remember a time in my life where there wasn't a computer present. So my, my father brought a Apple uh, two plus home from the office and I was used to it from then on. Um, my dad was, he was in the music business and he knew that he had like a nerd son. So he tried to find ways to bridge our interests. And he used to be a radio DJ and he kind of got into radio through amateur radio. So he used to drop me off with all these like Korean war vets to learn about radio when I was a really young kid. Like I got my license when I was still in grade school. And I did a science fair project where I built a large wireless network. It was long before Wi-Fi, but connected these radios to computers and then would send messages down the Mississippi river. And that, a uh, project ended up getting um, national attention. I was sent to the International Science and Engineering Fair and some local press in Minnesota resulted in me being offered an internship at a local technology company. And so I spent uh, 17 years, more or less. There was like two years that I, I left and I joined a startup um, that was headquartered in Palo Alto. But aside from that experience, for 17 years, I either wrote code or was a product manager or... Uh, acting in a management capacity helped with M&A activities, mostly tech due diligence and such. That was Digi International? Digi International, yeah. yeah. And they're still around. Great, great company. Um, they uh, are like the original IoT company. And I uh, got, I, I felt like I had sort of reached my limit developmentally there. And after nearly two decades, I really just wanted to change my life. And I, I became really fascinated with just how systems of people worked, particularly people that were building things. I got kind of like obsessed with the question, like, why is programming fun? Like, who's building who here? Like, am I writing the code? Or is like, the code and the and the like joy that I get out of it really like coaching me along to build something? And how do people work together and, and put stuff together? And so um, I found this management consultancy that was advertising itself, uh, underwriting this um, podcast and radio program called uh, Radio Lab. And I still remember the tag. It was uh, Undercurrent, a firm in a strategy firm in Lower Manhattan, thinking a lot about human refrigerator intera interaction, three D printing, and cat memes. And that like was a signal that was just like sent to the center of my heart. And I went and I I thought which is fair warning, like most uh, folks, I think should find management co consultants to be snake oil salesmen. But I'm like, all right, these snake oil salesmen, they're telling me that they're like influencing the management decisions of these really large companies. Yeah, whatever. I took the job anyway, moved to New York. And like a week later, I was at the top of 30 Rock with the people running GE, making decisions about what their future was. And um, it was awesome. But then I also, learned that the whole world is a lie and everything is really really clean and clear in a management textbook and like millions of people graduate from university thinking that management needs to be a certain way and if you just follow the way that it leads not only to um building the right things and exciting things but that the way that you manage people will also create fulfilling and good jobs for people and what I really learned firsthand is neither of those things are true. Everyone's house is a goddamn mess and the world is in need of, of reform. And yeah, we, we caught on to looking actually at 
we saw that and and some of the savviest business thinkers saw that the world was becoming a much more dynamic chaotic place and that the systems that governed how people work together needed to change agile was one of those things and then also famously general stanley mccrystal reformed the armed services to uh react to the reality of the theater of war inside of Afghanistan and Iraq and, and made it from a, a large hierarchical monolith into a bunch of peer wise networked organizations that could swap intelligence. And, and like where we are in technology and human reinvention, we started adapting some of those ideas and agile ideas to business more generally. And then that led naturally to wanting to make tools given my history and here we are. <laughs> It's interesting to, to see both the, the, the beginning of where you began and then seeing life is a lie of where up, up here and then to now actually launching your own uh, endeavor. And this is the first uh, company that you've co-founded, correct? That's right. Yeah, this right. is my first solo journey. <laughs> Exciting times ahead. Now, f- five years in, there's already a ton of, of learnings right there. And in our first episode, I already asked, you know, Looking back five years, what would you have done differently or, or have told yourself? Digging in that a little bit further, getting funding, what would you say um, if someone else is thinking about, about funding is a, the biggest mistake one could make when seeking funding? So um, I wrote, um, there's a blog post I wrote called Seed Raised by the Numbers. And if you are creating particularly a bottom up adopted company, this advice would apply. And what I mean by bottom up is like individual consumers are picking this thing up and they're, they're sharing it inside their organizations. This is sort of a B2B specific conversation. Um, when we got going, you asked about in the first segment, did we still offer coaching and why? One of the reasons for that, aside from just putting some cash in our bank account to give us more months of runway ahead, is because we kept hearing from our uh, prospective investors that they needed to see revenue. And, and they would give us this very specific feedback. They'd be like, mm, we don't think the remote market is large. We don't really think that meetings are an interesting pain point. Um, and uh, cool, I'd ask, great. What I, you know, I could never hold you to an investment. Obviously, I have no power over your decision making. But what, what would compel you? What would you need to see where you would be tipped forward out of your, your chair? And they'd say, well, we really want to see 10,000 in monthly recurring revenue, or we want to see 25,000 in monthly recurring revenue. What I've come to learn is that those are um, lazy things that people say that are generally not very well considered. And what happened is, is we started chasing revenue. So we, we monetized our product very quickly and we started to try and figure out what our conversion levers were and that was exactly the wrong thing to do if we were to start over again um what we instead would have done is is solve the business from what i call from left to right so if you think of it as a funnel where it's like you gotta get your message out there you gotta have people evaluate what your thing is you gotta have them try it you gotta have them attach you gotta have them maybe pay and then refer I would have just spent all the time right on the front of that, got that part of the machine running really, really well before even thinking about the the latter stuff. But we were doing it all at once and we were, you know, effectively three people. What, where it came down for us is that we um, had been through an accelerator who also encouraged us to chase revenue and we did get a pre-seed round, so we did get some institutional investment. We had uh, Slack uh, participate in the round. We had SB Angel. We had uh, AngelList. Really, really great top-tier investors. But when it came to getting the seed, we just kept hearing all this, you need more revenue, you need more revenue. And we, we spent that pre-seed funding far faster than we should have. We were, it was like six months, and it was like, poof. And we sat together. We had two months of cash left in front of us. And um, my colleague, Matt, said, well, screw this revenue thing. Let's just go for growth. Let's just make a hockey stick on the front end. What would we have to do? So we sat down and we're like, well, what market looks softest to us? Where could we adapt our technology in like six weeks and just go? And we, we, 
we found these retrospective meeting apps. We were fast follow. And we didn't think they were particularly well put together. They, they didn't seem well designed. They, they weren't very human. And um, we're like, let's just do that. And so we did. We like hacked out a retro app in six weeks. We announced it on Product Hunt. And um, man, that thing took off. It, was, it started off like 30% month over month growth. And then it accelerated. And, and we still had no revenue. And uh, aside from creating that hockey stick, then the market shifted around us, which helped where remote work started to be a thing in like 2019. And the phone, basically the metaphorical phone just went nuts. And people were like, can we lead you around? Can we lead you around? Can we lead you around? And part of the thing that we did that, that's different than just about any other company that I know of is we publish our metrics um, publicly. It's like us and Buffer basically. And so VC started following our blog and they just saw that hockey stick and it, and it whipped them up to a, a fever pitch. And um, then we basically were able to pick and choose who we wanted to work with. But long story short, focus on the front end of the funnel first. <laughs> Conversion, uh, it's all smoke and mirrors. Early. That question of, of where do you put your energy and focus is a powerful one. Moving into overall concepts around marketing and getting that tr initial traction, what do you see are some of the common mistakes that people and companies are making in the 21st century? <laughs> Too broad. Too broad's the... Too broads the 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 one that we made that's still like super common um, that we see among our peers. I think that there are two kinds of VCs in the world. Just roughly breaking people down to polarities. There's there's folks that have founded companies and those who are basically just banks personified. And the bank personified folks are really good at shepherding money. They they're they can be really, really good at making bets. They're not particularly good at dispensing business advice. And um, the bank personified folks will commonly say things like, well, your target market is too small. And what I say to that 95% of the time is poppycock. That's, that's stupid. Like if the market wanted your business to exist in mass, like a large market did, it would already exist. Like the market is efficient. So really, if you're an entrepreneur, what you want to do is you want to pick something so small that it's silly, but you want to convince yourself that if you're playing the chessboard, that you're not locked in by the pawns, that you can like attack these adjacencies really, really easily based on what you build. And when you're three folks, you don't have an advertising budget, so you better be focused on your organic channel or have a really awesome Rolodex. For us, that meant like laser targeting some SEO terms and then just crushing the content. And we um, played a super, super smart game really, really quickly to rank. And um, those are the things that added up to um, survival for us, basically. You make a, a great point team wise. If it's small, you've got to be smart. Looking at the team, you say going from two to five or six this year? Um, 12 now. 12, 12. So any insights on then growing a team and expanding a team that allows you to play a bigger game? Yeah, that's a really good question and highly context dependent. Um, there's a spectrum of businesses. So you've got uh, Uber-like businesses where your product sophistication is actually pretty low. Yeah, there's like tons of crazy tech behind the scenes, but fundamentally it's like push button car arrive, right? Like pretty narrow they didn't have to invent the iphone like they didn't have to invent the cellular network it's they didn't even have to bring the cars it's like push button car arrives right on the other end of the the spectrum you've got these businesses that are either really high tech or really uncertain in what your user needs i think for the push button businesses those are the blitz scale businesses that's the reed hoffman masters of scale like pack people on and go and dominate a market because it's easy to fast follow if you're in a more complex domain, hire as slowly as you possibly can and index when you're really small on the smartest generalists that you can. Our personal strategy is making a work environment that is a thousand percent less sucky than most startup environments. And what I mean by that is we are highly cadence oriented, like we have very few meetings and we maximize focus time we are very intentional about getting to know each other. We're very values aligned. So we just 
easily get along. And um, we're very flat, we're very open. And for the most part, unless there's a crisis, we don't work weekends. We work super hard during the week, but it's very dependable what your time is and what our time is. And you can also live wherever you want. Those things tend to add up to us to be a major strategic advantage. We, we like to say that we um, attract burnouts, which is true. Like if you look at our LinkedIn records, you've got people that were at Amazon and maybe didn't have the best employee experience at Amazon or you know, they were at large company X or Y or Z. Well-known, well-logoed, well-credentialed, excellent, excellent, smart folks. But um, work environment is a powerful strategic advantage when you're small. The other thing is to be really deliberate about how you hire. A friend of mine and a sage, a guy named Mike Arouse, has this quote that I love, which is, if you haven't decided, you're probably wrong. And that's true about a hiring process. You can't cargo cult that into your business. For us, what we do is we break it down into um, four rituals. So we have a fit for role interview where we assess uh, folks' skills. And we always write it out a priori. The questions are always the same. There's no um, like riddles or thought problems or anything along uh, those lines. Um, the next is a culture interview. That's also always standard. There's a small panel of folks and we're looking for evidence of certain uh, values. And then the third uh, process is we do a part-time project that we call a batting practice. So what we say to the candidate is we want you to de-risk us as much as we're de-risking you. Like it would be terrible if you were going to start with us and all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, these are not the people that I want to be working with. Like we'll give you that opportunity. So we pay an incredibly generous rate for 20 hours of people's time. We make it easy to squeak that in over as long of a time period as people need. And they work on something real with us, some real value. And then in the end, it's just negotiation and then we bring you on. But, but thinking about those moments and standardizing what your evaluations are really important. Where have you found great insights, whether it's leadership, business, personal development, when it comes to books, audiobooks, podcasts, or any go-tos that you would recommend? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, this is going to sound biased. And in, in fact, it's very biased. Um, Aaron Dignan was my former boss and, and current mentor um, at Undercurrent. He is currently um, the leader of a management consultancy called The Ready. And um, he has a podcast called Brave New Work. And he's written a book by the same name that was very, very, very popular. Um, we still pull a lot from him. He, he tends to aggregate a lot of interesting folks who are thinking about um, how people work together. And uh, hugely influential. For myself, I'm a big fan of um, Yuval Harari and Sapiens and his other thought pieces. I also like uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's uh, books, um, Anti-Fragile being the uh, latest that I think sort of nicely encapsulates the way that he thinks about risk in general and also systems of development. Um, and granted, like I don't take everything a uh, whole cloth from any of these individuals, but I find a lot that I can kind of pull together into tapestry. Um, those are those are the big ones for me. Oh, and I oh, and I absolutely love um, both uh, Ben and James over at the Exponent podcast, and of course Stratechery. Um, I I think that uh, by and large, when you zoom way 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 out on what's happening, he has. The right, actually, both of those individuals, often in their arguments, somewhere between both of their points, James and Ben, um, tends to be things that are very useful to think about um, in company building and in trying to address a market, et cetera, et cetera. Last question I have for you, Jordan. What kind of tech innovations do you predict we will see in the near term, next mm. year or so, and long term, five, 10 years from now? Yeah, it's interesting. We're, we're very product led. Like we use um, texts that are useful, but um, I'll address your question head on. But one, one thing that I, I want to mention is, do I think that uh, any of the current technologies 
that are in vogue. So as of this recording, within months, everyone was talking about GPT-3 for, for like a hot minute. Um, uh, AI and ML more generally, of course. Um, what I see is that as it should happen, there's a lot of noodle fridging that happens within US tech. So you, you get a bunch of folks who are either coming out of like the IV system or they're coming out of the tech world. Something meme wise raises like GPT-3 and then you see a million sort of like GPT for X startups, blockchain for X startups and they just noodle fridge and we sort of see what sticks. I think that that's actually a terrible way to build a company um, to be tech forward rather than problem forward and kind of fit the tech behind the problem. Um, that said, there are some things that are um, moving in tech that I find to be both fascinating and dangerous. And any great technology is has great upside and great downside. It's just a longer lever, right? I think um, a lot of what's going on in deep learning right now, it's it, we, we've hit the crazy point on the curve of acceleration in deep learning where I think, I don't like predicting the future very often, but I think this is a fairly secure one. I think we're gonna see this intense arms race, terrifying arms race over uh, 2020 and beyond where the deep fake detection folks won't be able to keep up with the deep fakes. And that is gonna unlock an incredibly weird world on us. Um, similar uh, down that vein is we're going to see the application of um, very, very large neural networks or um, composite AI systems doing things that are going to feel more and more magical, you know, like draw a sketch and all of a sudden it's like a physical device or um, attend a meeting and the whole thing is really neatly packaged up with here's exactly what was said. These things are categorized decisions. These are the actions here. It's neatly set up for you and so on and so forth. I think the thing that is, um, except for a few thinkers, like, you know, it's nice to see, I don't love everything Elon Musk says, but he tends to uh, have some real deep insights about some things that I agree with often. Um, very few tech folks that I interface ask themselves what the, what the downside, the negative externalities are around new technology adoption. And I think that uh, necessarily it's almost impossible to see what those downsides are until you start trying it. You know, like imagine a world where handing tasks to your workforce is as easy as just like soliloquizing for a, for a while. We don't know what impact that's going to have on a culture. And that's like the most benign example that I can think of. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.